Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Tammy Manis and Neil Lennon are here with me in the studio and here's what's coming up in today's show. Hib sack Lee Johnson and begin search for new boss. We are working extremely hard here and we will turn it. Brendan Rodgers claims Celtic are missing players to fit his system. Michael Beale hails return of experienced duo Lawrence and Roof. Those two guys have... I've seen a lot in the game and they'll help this dressing room. Steve Clark reveals why Elliot Anderson chose Scotland over England. Elliot was, was born in England, he's, he's got decisions to make and we're, we're just happy that he's come down on our side. So, lots to talk about, including uh, looking back over all the weekend's Scottish Premiership matches. Um, the hot topic is, of course, another managerial casualty early in the season, and Lee Johnson is the man who's fallen on his sword. Uh, no great surprise, uh, Ruffy, for certainly Tam and myself discussing mm. that defeat at the weekend. We didn't think um, it was going to be too long before the axe would fall. No, we've been speaking about it for the last two or three weeks now. It's the inconsistency, the results, you know... I think he'd been given a chance, he'd be given a few chances, you know, to turn it round. Uh, but he obviously hasn't done that and the, the draw, the result of Livingston at the weekend just sort of tapped it because when the supporters start voicing their, the concerns, you know, sometimes that I spoke about it on numerous occasions, boards have to have board meetings to discuss what they're going to do, you know, because they have to keep everybody on board. Yeah, of course, 3-2 defeat to Livingston consigned Hibs to the bottom of the table. And even after the match, Lee Johnson was adamant that he could still turn things around. i just say, look, you know, we are working extremely hard here and we will turn it. You know, the, the season, the league settles down, you know, when it becomes week to week. Um, and I just hope that when we do turn it around, because we will, you know, that, that, that those fans, uh, like, sort of accept that if you know what I mean and then sort of come back on side with us that, that's all I ask like, as... well he was asking for it he didn't get it um, and mm. really he couldn't build up any real momentum I looked over his time in charge Tam and there really was only two periods where he managed a string of four wins and then a string of three wins but after that it was all up and down yeah, listen. I think that uh, I think it was just a matter of time for Lee at the, at the minute. I think that uh, the start of the season, you know, they've not kept a clean sheet the first nine games. You know, that's not good enough. They're scoring goals at home. He kept coming out after interviews and saying we've got goals in us. We've got goals in us. It doesn't matter if you're conceding, you know, three goals at home, which they have done the first two home league games. You know, lost three two. He's been well backed. He's had three transfer windows. I always feel a manager deserves to get at least two. And Neil will know that. You know, you want you want to get your own players in. You want to get players out. He's in his third transfer window now, signed a lot of players. He's still playing the guts of the team that got Jack Ross the sack and got Sean Maloney the sack. <coughs> you know, he's brought players in that are, he doesn't think are any better than the ones that are there. That's why they're still playing. So, listen, I think it was I think it was the right call for Hibs. I think the supporters, as Ruffy said, you know, they're voicing the, the, the displeasure at the end of the game as well. So, I think it's the right call and the next appointment's pretty big. I think they've got the, <coughs> the last two wrong in terms of recruitment. The next one's big because they have invested a lot of money in the team and the squad and they can't afford to get the next one wrong. Yeah, this was a statement from Ben Kensel on the uh, sacking of uh, their manager. The club has taken the tough decision to relieve Lee Johnson of his duties following a disappointing start to the domestic campaign. Uh, we wish Lee and his coaching staff all the best for the future and thank them for their efforts. David Gray will take charge of the first team as caretaker manager for the immediate future and he'll be supported by Stuart Garden. Well, that was the decision, no real surprise. <coughs> um, as far as the runners and riders for the next Hibs boss, here's the odds so far. Um, our pundit, Neil Lennon, is 4-1, to one. Derek McInnes 5-1, to one. David Gray 6-1, to one. Uh, Stephen Robinson 7-1, to one. John Kennedy is 10-1, to one. and Ruffy Tam McManus is 100-1, yeah. to one, which what is... is why did you pick that picture? <clears throat> Honestly, that is just a joke. Yeah, well, so there's a better picture. So is the odds. <laughs> well, by the way, I've, I've, held, I've held off three minutes of the programme, and at the end of the day, PLZ Soccer has released a statement. Um, just basically, hands off our pundit. That's all I'm saying. Uh, the bags are packed. <laughs> You're on your way. Um, well, let's cut to the chase here. That's the nature of the game, Neil. You know, managers lose their jobs, and suddenly a door opens for someone else. Would you be interested? Uh, of course, because I've been there before. It's a big club. It's got uh, potential. 
but Tom's right. There's been change after change after change. There's been no consistency at coach level, and that's probably the most important role in the whole of the football club. So they have to get the next appointment right for a bit of longevity and a bit of stability. Um, I've watched Tibbs a few times this year. Um, going forward, you know, they have got some really good players, good speed in the team. But defensively, they're not working hard enough. Uh, it's stopping opportunities, stopping crosses, and that needs to be obviously corrected before they can make any sort of progress at all. What would you need as far as an assurance if they did come calling? Because no, 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 you're talking hypothetically here. Hypothetically. No, no, we're not going down this hypoth hypothetical route. We can't. So, look, there'll be a load of applicants, I'm sure, for the job. And it's really important that the board get <coughs> that right. Whether they approach me or not, it might be worth a conversation. But that's as far as I can go with it at the minute. Yeah. Do you think, though, anybody who comes in there needs to come in quickly because that window is going to close and they are going to be left with, in my mind, just as a personal opinion, in my mind, a back line that needs addressed? The back line does need addressed. Um, whether they can bring anybody <coughs> else in because... As Tom's alluded to, and I've spoken to a few people, they have spent money. You know, the the, the Gordons have backed, you know, the, the football side of things. So whether the window shuts or not, there's still a squad of players that are here far better than what they're showing at the minute in terms of um, results and performances. I do think in Lee's defence that the European campaign was, was difficult, you know, and Again, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. Thursday, Sunday, did they have the <coughs> strength and depth? That's proved to be not the case. And he is right. You know, when things do settle down, the team and the club will get better. But in the short term, I don't think they need to make a, a rash decision. They've got one more game before the international break where they can get everything sort of their ducks in a row with whoever they want to bring in. So I think that'll be the approach that they take. I'm only speculating on that. Yeah. Um, if I was going to be blunt about it, if I was looking at the Hibs situation, if you want to change the mentality and the psychology of Hibs to try and make them, uh, you know, a club that can start to look seriously about, not thinking about <coughs> let's just be above hearts in the table um, and have ambitions that would change the mentality, then for me, your man's the man. If it's not going to be him, then I think for me, the burning, you, you know, the hot candidate for me that could change the mindset as well is Stephen Robinson. Yeah, well, listen, I think that the three at the head of the market for me, you know, looking in it would be Neil, Stephen Robinson and Derek McInnes. They tick a lot of boxes. One, they're experienced in Scottish football. They've been there, they've done it. They know how Scottish football works. I think it's an, it's a unique league in terms of the way we play up here. You need to be fit, you need to be strong. Uh, you know, it's back to front a lot of the games. You know, they're, they're hectic. You've got to be, get players in that can handle that. It's robust. So they guys know that, the league. Um, and that's that's the ones that I think you should be going for. Sean Maloney was a bit of a punt. Young, play, young player just finished management. I don't think he got enough time, personally. I thought he should have got more time. You know, they got rid of him, and then Lee Johnson was, was English-based. You know, he worked most of his coaching career in England. So I think the focus must be now on someone who can come in, who's got experience of getting a team into Europe, you know, getting finishing top three, top four, particularly for a club like Hibs. Uh, and Stephen Robinson last year done it, obviously, with St Mum, you know, got in the top six and started the season well. So the three candidates I would narrow it down to would be, would be Neil, Stephen Robinson and Derek McInnes. And I wouldn't look outside those three at the minute. Do you buy into what I'm saying, Ruffy, about the psychology? Because that was the one thing that, you know, on countless press conferences that I, I would get into, and Neil was the, the Hibs manager, you know, before it was, oh, oh yeah, it was great, we got a 1-1 one -one draw. He wasn't having any of that. He wasn't tolerating, you know, this mediocrity of let's accept this. You know, because of his background, and and, and I think Hibbs benefited benefited from that greatly with Alan Stubbs as manager, mm -hmm. and and definitely benefited it from Neil's experience of this is what you yeah. need to have as a mentality to win games and stop stop accepting mediocrity. Yeah. I mean, I'm not just saying it because Neil's here and, and Tam's right. You know that they all tick the boxes, but the other two don't tick any of the boxes that Neil's got. Neil's got all the ticks. You know, European football, winning trebles getting the fans on board, getting the team playing particularly well. He's, he's the only one for me. Because if you ask any Hibs fans in the duration that he was there, they loved it. They loved every minute of it. They loved the excitement of it, the ups and downs, Neil throwing tantrums at the players, and they all accepted that. They all stepped up to the plate. And that's that's what they need. They need somebody like that. Well, just on the flip side of that, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I... 
I look at your first time in charge at Hibs, and I I see now a more mature. I'm not saying you're not going to be a, you're losing the argumentative streak because I think that's part of your DNA. Mm -hmm. But I see a more mature manager now. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean I'm 52 now, and I've been doing this for over 12, 14 years. So you do learn as you go along, and you pick probably pick and choose your moments more. You know when to. You, you, if you lose the anger though, Pete, you may as well forget it, because then you've lost your passion and your energy for, you know, trying to get the best out of the players. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely more rounded, and I do feel the my best years in front of me as a coach, and the Cypriot, you know, experience was really good for me as well in terms of working in a different environment, a different climate. Take yourself out of the equation. Do you uh -huh. understand what I'm talking about with th what the psychology and the mentality of Hibs needs to yeah, change? I mean, we tried to bring that, well, you did bring it in the, the first time you were there. But it has to maintain that, though, and it, it, it sort of loses. When you have to, we have to think, or we have to look at what is the, the club's direction? What do they want to do? What, the, what are their ambitions? They're obviously ambitious because they are throwing <coughs> money at it, you know, but um, it's maintaining that sort of standard you know, right the way through the club. And I think it's just sort of dropped off a little bit. But it's hard to maintain that consistency when you're constantly changing the manager. Yeah. Um, of course, let's not forget, uh, they lost to Livingston by three goals to two. Uh, and I did point out, Ruffy, before we hear from David Martindale, I did point out, well, if his argument was stacking up that he was driving a normal car against a Formula One car in Aston Villa, then Hibbs, by all accounts, should have thrashed Livingston, who are basically yeah. driving Del Boy Trotter's car. Yeah, well, we said that the weekend, that kind of coat can come back and haunt you and it came back very, very quickly. I thought Two of the goals they lost were very poor. I thought it was a tremendous strike for the, the boy for the third goal. Yes, and Gary. Took it very, very well. But apart from that, they didn't see that there any cohesion. You know, they, they, they looked like a, a team all over the place, all relying on Boyle doing something, you know, and it just never worked. And the yeah. defence, as we've discussed, is poor. Yep, absolutely. And fair play, uh, David Martindale singing the praises of the aforementioned Sangari for that wonder goal. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, I'm, I think I was the only one in the stadium shouting, Mo, don't shoot! Um, a day of shooting is all Mo generally joins and he keeps, this is his language, he keeps saying, Gaffer, I'm going to lick it, I'm going to lick it. And every week I'm going, Mo, when am I going to see this ball getting licked? <laughs> so he's came right off the park, he went, Gaffer, I licked it. <laughs> I went, you certainly did, kid, you certainly did. Great goal and uh, well worthy of... Winning that match, three goals to two, so Hibs are on the lookout for another manager. We've uh, obviously asked the question, uh, and now we'll just wait and see if, indeed, uh, Ruffy, we have to go out next week and start searching for another pundit of real prowess, you know, somebody who doesn't shirk the tackles. Sorry, Neil will so, still be here. That's uh, okay. <laughs> For Tom. <laughs> exactly. Only <laughs> <laughs> I, I might put a fiver on it myself, Ruffy, see if we can get rid of him. Um, but anyway, uh, here's a look at the results and how that Hibs result um, pitched in with the rest over the weekend. Ross County nil, Rangers two. We're going to talk about a cracking goal in that game. Celtic nil, St Johnston nil. Uh, Motherwell two, Kilmarnock won a late late show there. Dundee surprised us all with a one nil win against Hearts, apart from obviously Tam. And then it was a late equaliser for Aberdeen to salvage a point in that match, St Mirren 2 Aberdeen 2 um, I've got to say, uh, Ruffy, if, you, if you're talking about goals, you know, that we get excited about, I, I just thought if anybody else in any part of the UK you know, and Europe scores the goal that James Tavernier scored, mm. you know we'd be raving about it, you know, non-stop I thought it was top drawer Yeah, I think we, we are all raving about it it was, I mean, picked it up in the halfway line Although defensively, Ross County never did end to shut them down. They let them come and come, and then the back four backed off. I mean, you can't take it away for the strike. They're just a technique now. The modern play has the modern player has now a strike in the ball, and he certainly he does it with his free kicks and everything. And he sort of used it uh, when he scored that goal. It just seemed to fly up and then down. I mean, I know the balls are a wee bit lighter now, but you can't take it away. It's a fantastic strike. Yeah, he, he's one of those characters that I think when eventually he hangs up his boots at Rangers, um, people will maybe look back with a greater fondness than they do at the moment. I really like him. Oh, 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 not so much his defensive capabilities where he's uh, he's had a few shortcomings with that. But, you know, going forward from that right back position, you know, he's been outstanding. You know, and he delivers in big games as well, Peter. And that's a sign of a, of a very good player. And there's, 
you know, as Ruffy touched on his technique and, and finish is, is top class. I mean, that's over 100 goals he scored from right back. That's an incredible, incredible return for a player at that position. Yeah, even with the penalties, Tommy, he does chip in with, you know, uh, goals, you know, wonder goals every now and then and crucial goals when he's ghosting in at the back post. Yeah, I, I totally agree with the guys. I think he's a terrific technical footballer. I've always thought why he, Rangers maybe didn't play him one forward. Mm. I know they didn't play a 4-4-2, but I think that would be ideal for him. You know, maybe a full-back behind him and just let him go and get out of full-back and whip balls in. Kind of David Beckham type, uh, whipping balls in. But no, I think he's I think he's a fantastic player. I think him and Barisic as a striker, I think you're, you're loving life if they two are full-backs because both of them play high, get forward, take a touch, bang balls in the box. So if you're a striker, you can make your runs because you know the ball's coming in. Um, defensively, not great, but... In terms of Scottish football, they don't really need to defend a lot. You know, they, they want to get forward and create and, and score goals in, in, in domestic football. So, no, I think I think Tavernier's a, a tremendous footballer. Yeah, um, big win for them and, of course, in a big week for Rangers. Every week seems to be a big week, according to the manager. And he did um, obviously welcome the return of one of the goal scorers, Kimar Roof. And, of course, Tom Lawrence is back in the squad too. I heard that was his first start in a long, long time. Well, he seems to play and score, doesn't he? Which is a, a good trait to have. Let's hope, let's hope that he can stay fit longer now and consistently. And, and it was nice to see Tom Lawrence back as well. I think after the international break, Tom certainly playing from the left coming inside or as a number 10 will give us an extra boost in terms of quality, I think. And again, experience. Those two guys have... I've seen a lot in the game and they'll help this dressing room. We've got a lot of new players coming in, first time in the league. And I think those type of guys coming back and being around the team will be a big boost. Yeah, massive boost uh, for the squad that he has available and players becoming fit just at the right time. How, how massive is the game against PSV in relation to what happens on the Sunday? I think this is arguably Michael's biggest week as a, as a coach and a manager. You know, Champions League qualifier second leg away and then Celtic on, on the Sunday. And um, how the game pans out on Wednesday, I think, will have a huge psychological burn on their approach to the game come Sunday. Obviously, you know, if they win, they'll be on the up, the place will be rocking. If they lose, you know, they'll be on a bit of a downer, but you can always sort of get yourself up again for a, a big derby like that. And I thought that was an impressive win, Pete, I have to say. You know, going up there in between the two PSV games, you know, half 12 kickoff, three hour drive, three hour drive, a really good win because Ross County have been scoring goals. So, really professional <coughs> performance and it breeds confidence as well. Yeah, um, in contrast, to that, I don't think too many people um, who left Dingwall happy at the points that Rangers had managed to get um, would have believed that Celtic were going to slip up against a St Johnson side who'd only managed one win since the start of the season, and that was against Alloa Ruffy. Yeah, I think you have to give a wee bit of credit to St Johnson, uh, the manager we were talking about him last week there. He seems to have grabbed three or four players for down south, you know, who have come in right away and settled. And if you look at the whole game, you know, I mean, in any other given day, Celtic could have scored four or five, uh, but they didn't, you know, and I think the support were just hanging on there. It's going to come now, it's going to come now. But sometimes it doesn't come, you know, but as long as they keep playing, you know, you think it's going to come. But I just think the tide has turned a wee bit now. I think Rangers now uh, have got a good, strong bench substitutes whereas last time it was Celtic that were throwing on people for the bench and winning games and scoring goals so that hasn't happened so far I'm not saying it's not going to happen all the time because there are a lot of injuries out there but uh, I think it's going to be interesting at the weekend I must be missing something here and obviously you, you'll be able to tell me uh, and obviously give us an insight into it Neil but okay Jota's gone they got money for him they had 50 million in the bank they've got the Champions League money coming They've got a squad there that's won a treble. And if you read the comments now of Brendan Rodgers, this is what he has to say about, you know, the players that he wants to bring in and try and level this out with the performance against St Johnston. Brendan Rodgers said, it's clear if you go back to my first time here, the team was fast and dynamic. They got through the lines quickly. They created goals. They scored goals. So this is what we'll eventually get to here. But we're missing those certain profiles. Hopefully we can bring that into the squad and be a lot cleaner and quicker in our play. I, I, am I missing? Did something go woefully wrong with Ange Ball at the end and a treble winning team? 
Yeah, I think he's obviously looking for more pace in the team, more energy in the team in the forward areas. I think it's, but that's down to probably his style of play as well. Ange Postacoglu was a, f a high pressing game, you know, pressed up the pitch, quick throw ins, you know, quick free kicks, everything quick, try and swamp teams, particularly at home. And I think he's more pragmatic in his approach. He wants to play through the lines, you know, but I, I think he should just stuck with the same kind of model as Ange Postacoglu in terms of getting forward and pressing teams. I, th I don't think they're pressing high enough. I don't think they're pressing quick enough teams. And maybe he's thinking he's not got the players for that, but they've done it last year, Peter. So why is... I don't see the difference between a similar pool of players. He's got Maida and Kyogo, they started the press. Why is why is he, he talking about being clean and, and you know, more pace going through the team? Well, listen to what you've just said there and what you and I had a chat with before we come on here. You don't agree with him. I don't think there's much difference between both managers' approaches. Mm. It's just that, um, you know, Brendan's always played... Try to play a fast flowing football. He wants to get that back. But at the minute, they're uh, overpassing it by all accounts. And um, there's definitely a flatness about them, Pete. You know, the squad definitely does need impetus. You know, that, that comes with quality players coming in the building. They touched on it last week. There's been no movement this week, which has surprised me. And I'm thinking, you know, with this game looming next Sunday, he needs some sort of. They all need a bit of a lift. And that means quality players coming into the building. Yeah, well, I'm looking at it, and Lewis Palmer, um, that's a three and a half million pound signing from Aris um, that everybody expects to see in a Celtic jersey. He might need to get an experienced uh, centre half in as as makeshift cover mm -hmm. short term because of the injuries. Um, you know, you're looking, you're saying to yourself, does he need a striker? He needs a striker. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're looking at the chances. The goalkeeper was great, roughly first and Johnson on Saturday, but all the chances fell to. O'Reilly, you know, he could have had a hat trick to prefer, and he looks the only one at the minute. You know, he's got his bit between the teeth and looks like he's a, he's a threat. Uh, they definitely need a striker, and the, for me, they still need more physicality in the midfield, more legs. Um, I'm not sure about his comments after the game. You know, I understand what he's saying about you know playing free, fast, flowing football, but you're spot on. They're the same players from last year. They're just not. I don't know if they're. Struggling with a bit of fatigue from last season, you know. I think <coughs> certainly in Callum McGregor's case, you know, he's played a lot of football, you know, and he needs a bit of a hand, you know. But they need a bit more energy and a bit more quality, and that, that's really been apparent from the last two games. And if you're a manager, do you get into a darkened room and scalp your head off a wall when you start um, reading a bit of social media that Shabanovich is, you know, a cryptic message? That no, no, that's not good, you know. That's not good from the player, and um, this is the. This modern, is, it's modern day football, yeah, isn't it? This is what you have to deal with, you know, and I'm sure Brendan will deal with that in his own way. It's not it's not a good look from the player. Nothing to do with the manager or the or the staff for me. And you know, I, I get that he's frustrated and not playing, but we only look three, four games into the season. Yeah, I'll tell you another thing, Ruffy, that um a lot of Celtic <coughs> fans will look and say, This is a little bit of deja vu, but suddenly it's down to the wire. It's a transfer window that's going to close pretty quickly and it's a draw for the Champions League that's coming. And, you know, I think Brendan, if you asked him right now, he says he needs about four or five players. Yeah, and again, Neil will know better than, than us when it comes to a transfer window. Do you have a list there? Do you have a list of A selections or B selections? Do you have it on tap? How quickly can you get them in? Because it seems to be a lot harder now to get somebody to sign a piece of paper with everything that goes with it. I, I do think this, the striker's the one, the big one for me. I think up front, three very, very good players up front, but now predictable. Mm. Every team, the physical now, presence. Every me. team now, now knows what's going to happen. It's either going to go to Maeda, it's going to go to Abada, and it's going to get flashed across, and Kyogo's going to try and steal a half a yard a yard. So defenders now know what's coming. So I think they're now, they've been more prepared now, so I think there needs to be more variety. Well, I'll tell you what they need in the striker, uh, Neil, because let's not forget, Ange was a failure in Europe um, because they had the chances to win games. I wouldn't say a failure is a well, bit... Two points. Yeah. He had two points in the Champions League group stages, but the point the point here is Ange was, Ange was always of the opinion, and you equally so when you were a manager, You've got some players that you can try and make better players. Mm -hmm. You've got a realisation that there are some players that are a level that are not going to be able to get you to that next level. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking for, for me, a striker who's a bit of a battering ram, who can maybe mix it up and be different from Kyogo. I still look, and, and I know they're not easy to attract, but I still think he needs a number 10 
he still needs somebody that can open a defence with a pass and do something yeah. from the middle of the park, Neil. And they're hard to come by, I know. But well, they, they, they lacked creativity last week, you know, and <laughs> obviously, judging by the result at the weekend, you know, they're missing that Marovchik type player who, you know, but they're, like you said, they are hard to find. But I, I do think they do need to mix it up a bit in terms of the the type of player, the profile of the player that they're bringing in. I quite liked Jack Amakis. You know, he left for his own reasons. You know, somebody like him, he's mobile and, and strong and, and can score a goal. I think that's, you know, apparent that, that, that that's what they need at the top end of the pitch to supplement what Kyogo brings. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, big, trans- <clears throat> big transfer window, obviously, this week for them to see what they get, but a huge draw in the, the Champions League to come. Yeah, it's very exciting, although you don't, want to go into it on a dampener having lost the Rangers so again while we talk about a big week for Michael it's an important week for Celtic as well yeah massive absolutely massive just one little footnote which I think it would be remiss of me not to mention it for a boy who had a very very difficult start mm-hmm. well done to Stephen McLean because that was massive for them to get a point when everybody thought it was going to be four fives and six yeah I don't think anyone outside that St Johnson dressing room I even think there was maybe players in that St Johnson dressing room who thought we could be into hiding here. You know, this, the way they've started the season, we spoke about last week, he kind of, he dug out a few experienced boys last week uh, and maybe he's had a reaction for that in training, whatever. But to go there and get a nil-nil draw uh, is a fantastic result for St Johnson and that could be the catalyst for them, you know, to maybe kick on and pick up a few results now because no one expected them to do it. And uh, they got them off the bottom of the league as well, and unfortunately Hibs are there now. Yeah, um, listen, we've got to sing the praises of managers who are uh, ripping it up and consistently, you know, not so much surprising as, but just showing that consistency. Yet again, St Mirren mm-hmm. will feel they should have been, you know, free and easy and comfortable with three points against Aberdeen. In the end, it was a 2-2 draw. No, I think St Mirren have been the team of the, the year so far. I think they're playing attractive football, they're winning games, a lot of confidence. It's great to see the, the stadium full uh, St Mirren supporters. It shows you they're doing something well. I thought they were very, very unlucky at the weekend not to win that game. You know, I thought they should have. They had lots of chances. I thought Aberdeen were suffering a wee bit, but Aberdeen got the break at the end of the day. But uh, no credit to them and uh, that's the reason why the supporters are cram in the stadium because they're seeing good football yeah of course and you always like two young managers who uh, say what they think and don't hold back we had one uh, we've got one here who uh, was great in press conferences I used to love getting to your press conferences by the way <laughs> they were fantastic I just used to sit down hit the record button in the camera and think okay throw the first grenade and let's carry on <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, is that not part of the rules sometimes oh, it's to, to, to get messages out there like, right. you know what I mean the way you want them to come across yeah, I mean, might, not, might not be everyone's cup of tea but you've got to be true to yourself like, yeah. you know? before you come into the press conference after the game I can't remember who they were playing but Jim Duffy was the manager Morton um, I'd made about three grand I said oh, Duffy will take him out in one punch <laughs> <laughs> Taking bets out all over the place, but Duffy's the only manager that's hit me by the throat and, and I get Dundee. Yeah, I, I told him to f off in a practice game. He said I was offside and it was a bounce game. I went, I'm not playing offsides, and it, I had to walk through the training ground back to Dens Park, which was about a mile and a half, and people beeping their horns and all that. And I was walking my <laughs> training gear, and he came in and he grabbed me by the throat. Yeah, and had me with. I said, you ever tell me f off again? And I've never told him again. I bet you do not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wise man. In his eye. Wise man. Well, we'll move to Derry. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Um, anyway, Barry Robson didn't shirk the questions. He wasn't happy with his side. But my message after the game to the players was clear. I said, this is it. This is how it is when you've got to be on the road as much as we are. And um, we looked a yard off it everywhere. Um, and I said... When, the biggest thing in football, see, see when you feel like you can't win it and things are not going, don't lose it. And um, they showed that the day and they were, they were, they fought and they hung in and they were fighting. And they ended up with a point, albeit uh, right at the death with a penalty, but it doesn't matter because sometimes you just got to hold your hands up and say, well, we're rank rotten, but hey, you get a point. They had a really tough game midweek, you know, came away with a great result there, haven't been too down. And it, I think Barry's alluding to the fact they were leggy, you know, and they were. And St Mirren were fresh, but they're on a, a great place at the minute, Pete. <coughs> and, um, you know, thoroughly deserved to win the game. You know, the two goals disallowed, 
Some of the football they're playing is, is excellent. And then the right good place, you know, Stevens found this formation of 3 4 3 that's really working well for them, you know. Um, and that was a really tough game for Aberdeen. He makes a great point. If you can't, if you can't win it, don't lose it. So to come away with a point, they'll, they'll take that and move on up the road. They have a big game this week as well, obviously. Yeah, um, I, I like um, Stephen Robinson's assessment of how his team performed. They, they feel like they should have another two points. Um, but ultimately we don't. But if you play like that, which we have done for the last six, seven games, um, you know, we controlled the game, I thought. I thought we passed the ball really, really well. Opened Aberdeen up, who, you know, spent a lot of money on a very good side. You know, let's not make a mistake about that. They're, they're doing very well, done very well in Europe. But um, I think we we actually made them look average today because of our performance. You know, they're a good side, but our quality, I thought, was outstanding today. Um, you got to take into consideration, Tam, this was a guy whose budget was cut last year. Now he's had to rejig this side. But, uh, you know, every manager tells you, Neil will tell you, you know, if you want to play a certain type of football, if you can get players who are able to execute your plan, and they're doing it right now. Yeah, listen, I think he's done a terrific job at St. Man. I uh, liked him at Motherwell, he, he chose to go down. I think it was more coming went down. He didn't don't th think it worked out down there, but come back to St. Man, great season last year. You know, beat Celtic as well at home, one of the only teams that beat them last season. Um, started this season really, really strongly. They've got, they've got a bit of everything. They've got pace in the forward areas. They're, they're, they've got dig. They've got legs. Uh, they're tough to break down. They're good at home, and they play good football. What I would say is, is they've played Hibs and Aberdeen, who have both come off of European games in the first three games, which help, has helped them. I'm not taking anything away from them, um, but I think they're, they're doing really well at the minute, and they're a team who, for me, can be pushing. I think third's, third could be wide open this year. I think that Aberdeen are going to be in the group stages of something, whether it's Europa or Conference League, Hearts, Hibs. You know, I think there's, there's room for a St Mirren if they get a wee bit of consistency to maybe push into that top three or four. Well, I, I like what he's doing at St Mirren, but I genuinely hope that Aberdeen can get Europa League and I think beating Hacken is well within their capabilities. No question. Um, <coughs> it's a great result. They show a lot of character as well, Peter, to come from two down. So uh, you'd imagine Pedro will be rocking um, come this week, and in defence of, of Barry, you know they they would have come back on Thursday night, you know day off ready, one day to prepare for the game and then go again. So, so this is the thing that he's he's trying to get across to the players, and we've talked about Hearts and Hibs as well. You know they're not used to it; they'll have to get used to it. You know if they're going to be, you know, trying to compete for European places and then getting into the European competitions. So. Off the back of the game against Hack, and you know that's a good result. That is a good, and uh, on, just on Stephen, his recruitment's been fantastic. Mm. You know they go down and use the English market really well, Tom, and mm. that must be from his experience of of working down there. And he picks up these little bargains, and this is all with the Hara being out of the team, who was probably their best player last season as well. So they're in a good place at the minute too. Yeah, absolutely, Ruffy. I don't think any of us. I mean, I'm going to offer, offer an apology because we're man enough to do it. Uh, we all laughed. <laughs> When, when he suggested Dundee would beat Hearts, we laughed in the yeah. studio, looked at him as if he was completely crazy, and stoned the crows. Well, it, I think we really have to take on board now what everybody's been saying. Neil's been saying it, he's been saying it. European football's taking its toll. Uh, I never expected Hearts to go there and, and lose the game. Uh, I, I thought they'd been a bit better. They looked a bit jaded as well. They were really off it. And uh, I thought Dundee, in the end of the day, finally you know, got the win that they needed, but it was a terrible goal to lose, you know, from Xander Clark and the, the defender and then trying to build up for the back and then lose it, lose possession and then lose it. I can't take any away from McGowan, the goal itself, but Hearts just didn't look at it at all. Yeah, uh, you know what, see sometimes, uh, Tam, when you're watching uh, games or even when you're at the game and you start seeing everybody wanting uh, to play a certain type of football, and then you have a fullback who plays a ball into the middle of the park, which is condensed to say the least. And Phil March to the Dundee player McGowan, he just he just spotted him and lovely bit of craft. Good player, I like him, Luke McGowan. Good yeah. left foot. Uh, I liked him, seen a lot of him in the Championship uh, last season. I think Dundee have got a lot of talented younger players in their team as well. I thought that's the only reason I went for Dundee. Hearts a tough game. They've got a tough game coming up. They're still in the tie. Dundee have got energy in their team. They've got pace. Uh, they're hungry, they've just came up, they want to prove a point, you know, been written off by a lot of teams. And I just thought Den's part, that's, I think Hearts will struggle up there and uh, and that's what happened. Hearts were poor, but fair play to Dundee, they deserved to win the game. I watched the highlights, they totally deserved to win the game and great for Tony Docker to get his first 
win as a manager uh, in, in the Premier League and you know, that's a great result for them, D, and they can go and try and kick on now and pick up more points. It's yeah. a bit, bit of an admission <clears throat> for the manager saying he wasn't on the team lines at the start. Yeah, well... He said he wasn't made a mistake in the team lines. He wasn't Steve on it. Nesmith? He wasn't on the team He's lines. Who, who, McCowan? No, and Dundee. Yeah, D- Tony Docherty okay. said McCowan wasn't on he the team lines. He wasn't on the team lines. Was he not? No, no oh, he that's... wasn't on the team lines and uh, he'd handed in the team lines and the referee wouldn't let him change it back because it wasn't because of an injury. Yeah, well, that's a. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I once, I once <laughs> with him on STV as a result. Show. He came out with four stats, and and Ruffy never comes out with stats. And I, and I looked at him and I thought, mm, that's too many stats in one sentence. And we doing? went to the break, all of them inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> best, <laughs> I come back out. I thought, really? So the, the best one of all was Adam Rooney. Oh. Struggling for a striker, Scotland. I said, we need to have a look at him. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyway, Tony Dockery was singing the praises of McCowan after the game. Absolutely. It doesn't surprise me, but look, I think if any years I've seen, he did that against Fleetwood pre season, he did it if you actually further out. And uh, at the time, I'm saying pass, pass, but then I remember he did it before, so it doesn't surprise me. You know, good player, uh, Luke McCown, and he kind of typifies the type of player I've got in that changing room. So, really pleased for him, but uh, more more pleased for the squad in terms of, you know, they got the rewards today for all the hard work they've put in. Yeah, big confidence boost. Uh, what's your take on Hearts chances now in 2-1 uh, down from the home leg? Very difficult. Greek teams are pretty good at home. Mm. I'd, I'd, to be honest with you, I thought Payak were good value for the win. I thought second half they came on really strong and um, yeah, they, they just looked a little bit better, but more quality, more more dangerous and more speed. So yeah, I think it's difficult. If they keep conceding goals like that, Pete, they've got no chance. I mean, could you imagine me if yeah. my team had conceded a goal like that with Sandra Clark playing left back and you're right playing it in the midfield, Ruffy, and just inviting the pressure. It's madness, absolute madness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, late, late show at Fir Park, two one in the end. Uh, if you go, if you go, I love goals like that. Last, there's no way back. Oh, you know you've scored oh. the winner, yeah. and uh, Harry Payton certainly milked it. Yeah, brilliant for Mother. I think the commandant going one 0 at half time. You're thinking pff, they've not conceded a goal so far this season, and uh, Mother will get the equaliser and get the momentum we go and win the game. As you said, last kick of the ball. There's no comeback for the other team. And Stuart Kettle was another manager that's doing well. You know, I've not mentioned him. You know, so they've done. They've started the season really, really strongly as well. And uh, he will looking up the table as well. There's a lot of teams in there. St. Mirren, you know, Mother will come on. He'll be. I think he'll be looking further up the table rather than usual. You know, bottom two, bottom three. I think they'll be looking not only top six, but the, with clubs struggling at the minute, Aberdeen, Hearts. You know, Hibs all, all off to very slow starts. They, they, they could be looking at that top three, four as well. Yeah, Derek McKinnon's the Kelly boss. Pig sick at that late, late goal. Um, so, it's a sore one. I had my address to the players in my head before the, the final whistle about um, well, we're disappointed. It probably tells us a lot, a lot that we came away with a point here and we're disappointed. And then it was the, the belt in the mouth that we're always trying to avoid. Everybody knows in football it's just around the corner and that was ours today. Um, You've got to credit Motherwell, they've made the most of that situation, they've committed bodies forward, but we were still in a decent position at the halfway line to, to stop that happening. Yep, uh, unhappy with the overall result, but fair play to Mother and great credit to them getting the 2-1 win uh, for Stuart Kettlewell. Um, I think uh, as you look at the Premiership table, here's how it looks as we head into a big week with a massive game coming up. Not great for the Hibbies, uh, the bottom of the table, then it's St Johnston, Aberdeen, Ross County, Livingston and Kilmarnock. Uh, but up in that top six, uh, Celtic still at the top, closely followed by St Mirren and Motherwell on goal difference, and then Rangers getting that confidence boosting win knowing that they could go top of the table um, albeit ahead of Celtic um, if results go their way in that Old Firm game on Sunday so it's massive time I'm on obviously St Mirren and Motherwell have something to say about yeah, it yeah it's amazing games. it's amazing the, the, the change in a couple of weeks I think when, when Rangers lost to Kilmarnock you know Celtic weren't great uh, you know against Aberdeen and Ross County but a lot of Celtic fans were going into this game at Ibrox a couple of weeks ago thinking, yeah, Rangers are not, don't look great. Maybe we'll go and beat them. I think it's maybe a wee bit of trepidation now among Celtic supporters, but I think it's a totally different game. It's a totally different game. Rangers will attack Celtic. Celtic, the last two games Celtic have played, they're playing against packed defences, teams that have sat in. 
and I think it's a totally different game, an open game at Ibrox, and I think that will suit Celtic as well. So. Will Brendan be an angry man having lost that little cushion? It's early, early days, but it's still a... He'd be, he'd be not angry, but he'd be frustrated, you know. Um, psychologically, it's always good to have that little cushion going into this game. Um, Tom makes a good point about, you know, Rangers actually coming out and, and having a go at Celtic, and it might play into Celtic's hands. First goal's always pivotal in these games. You know, normally if you get the first goal, you either go on to win it or you certainly don't lose it. So, And Celtic are more than capable of scoring in any ground in Scotland, but they just need to... Need to find their levels, Pete, otherwise it could be a long afternoon. Yeah, um, OK. Uh, it was certainly a long afternoon on Saturday and Sunday when we started to look at the predictor because I was wondering where I was going to get a point from, Ruffy. You had a, a fantastic weekend, which yeah. means that you must have had three gin and tonics and four laggers um, as chasers um, because yeah. you had 13 and a half points, Ruffy, which is so yeah, rare. Yeah, I did OK, considering I missed the first week. I'm um, just sort of a building myself up for the for the running but uh, Tam's up there on the top is he? Yep, Tam's up there at, at 42. Uh, 42 I'm at 149, then Alison then you Ruffy after that sensational week, then Kerry and Adam and well done to proud Scott who's blasted out in front with 29 points and I think proud Scott will be the winner of our first monthly prize which is not bad. That's great, monthly <coughs> prizes every month, uh, hopefully he's a He's a Celtic fan because he's getting a signed new lens strip sent to him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that'll be right. But uh, uh, good of Tam to tell you that the, there's a yeah. But <laughs> you went for it, not me. Um, good of Tam to point out that uh, the monthly prize is every month. So we move on uh, now to the Scotland squad, <laughs> the Scotland squad um, which of course Steve Clark looking forward to uh, the double header coming up and it's massive for us, Xander Clark, Angus Gunn, Liam Kelly, Jack Henry, Aaron Hickey, Scott McKenna, Nathan Patterson, Ryan Portis, Andy Robertson, John Souter, Kieran Tierney, Elliot Anderson's in there as a Scot, Stuart Armstrong, Lewis Ferguson, Billy Gilmore, Ryan Jack, John McGinn, Callum McGregor, Kenny McLean, Scott McTominay, Che Adams, Ryan Christie, Lyndon Dykes, Kevin Nisbet and Lauren Shanklin. Um, so, Cyprus and then of course the friendly with England, Ruffy. Yeah, I think the Cyprus one's a big one. I think the supporters already thinking about buying their tickets for Germany and I think if we win that one, I think it'll be done and dusted, you know. So, it's great to be back. If, if we are get back to being... You know, these top competitions is great, you know, and, and hopefully we'll be there as well. I'd love to go as a supporter. Yeah. You know, and Do you want to work at it? I just yeah, want to yeah. know. It's just, it's, it's, Neil wants to know if he's packing a bag to work or is you just going as a fan? Uh, I'll work and be a fan as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As long as, I, as long as I know where the drill is here. Um, we sent our man Adam Binney out to find out what Steve Clark was talking about ahead of these two. I'm at Hamden Park this afternoon to speak to Scotland manager Steve Clark as he's just announced his senior men's squad for upcoming fixtures against Cyprus and England. When you look at that squad, the first name that jumps out really is Elliot Anderson, the Newcastle midfielder, has earned his first ever call-up to the senior national team. Now, he made headlines a few months ago when he opted to play for an England youth team and rejected the call-up from the Scotland under-21. So, as you can imagine, manager Steve Clark is pleased to have him finally commit his future to Scotland. Obviously, he's a good player, and he's he's doing well for his club. Uh, Elliot's one has been through the the underage groups with Scotland. One we've had an eye on. He had a an inquiry, a little think about choosing between Scotland and England. Uh, some good discussions with the the boy and his, his family, and he's chosen to come with us, which I think is good for us now, and certainly good for us in the future. So Elliot Anderson is in, but there's no place for Ben Doak, the Liverpool winger, impressed during pre-season for Jurgen Klopp's side, and has even since made a couple of substitute appearances in the Premier League. He still has to wait on his first call-up to the senior men's national side, but manager Steve Clark says this time around he was very close. I think anybody who's doing well for their club, especially at a club like Liverpool, playing off the bench in the English Premier League, are always going to be close. I just feel on this occasion was was the right time to bring in Elliot, and... Ben knows that we're watching him, he knows that he's, he's part of the, the future but he has to continue doing what he's doing at his club and he has to continue playing well and if he does that then I'm, I'm sure his turn won't be too far away. Yeah, you can tell we're on the up because suddenly we're finding players <laughs> yeah. that, that want to play for us as well. That's fantastic, I agree with Ruffy, I think um, 
if they go to Cyprus, which you know it'll be stodgy, but you know they've got too much quality for Cyprus, that'll be more or less it. You know, which has been a fantastic campaign so far. And you know, just looking at the variety he's got to choose from now, Pete, and the quality, the, the depth of the squad is absolutely excellent now. Yeah, nice to get Elliot Anderson on board. He, I mean, he came on yeah. in the game against Liverpool. Yeah, I don't know much about him at all. The, the one I'm really wanting to see is Billy Gilmer. I uh, know Billy Gilmer settled in at Brighton. He's, the reports we're getting, he's absolutely fantastic. You know, I think he's going to be a right big player for us. Uh, I really do. Once he gets in there and gets, you no. Know, bedded in and gets game on game so no any young player coming in you know obviously they've watched them quite a lot of times you know and I hopefully maybe not the Cyprus game but you've got to give these young players a chance it's no point in just bringing them to get used to the setup. we want to see what they can do see yeah. in terms of the midfield there I mean the, the options he's got it's in the middle of the park is frightening I mean Lewis Ferguson scored against Juventus yesterday and I don't think he'll be near the team you know Billy Gilmer Carl McGregor who's Probably started a bit slowly at Celtic. You know, McTominay can get, you know, they've got John McGinn. The, the options that, that he's got, Kenny McLean, in that midfield area is the strongest I've in my lifetime anyway for, for a Scotland, Scotland squad. You're optimistic though? Great for us if we could go to Germany. Yeah, absolutely. And Neil's obviously he worked over in Cyprus and he, he thinks well, he fancies us to win, so hopefully he's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, could you hack going to Germany with us? Would it be. Uh, nah. No. I mean, the last thing you want to do. hack going anywhere if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not after the afternoon we've just spent. Anyway, um, yeah, so fingers crossed for Scotland, everybody behind Steve Clark. Um, as far as the games over the weekend in the English Premier League, um, there was a few tasty ones, none better uh, than the one at uh, St James's Park because Newcastle and Liverpool, Ruffy, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was unbelievable. Yeah, as you know, uh, I've changed now. My new team is Newcastle down in England. All right. Because of my on the band Wait a minute, you changed from who? Uh, it used it used to be Man City. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Who's your favourite European oh. team? Who's your favourite European team? But you you back every year to win the Champions League quickly. Oh, Paris Saint Germain. Yeah. So the guy's just it's just money. Yeah. yeah. You only usually back clubs that are owned by a state, don't you? <laughs> Is that fair, Ruffy? No. <laughs> no, I've supported Man City most years, and they've done it now. Yeah, and they've done it. So I'm See, moving on to, to somebody else. Yeah. Okay, I'm sticking with Liverpool uh, forever and a day. Um, it was a great game, wasn't it? Cracker, humdinger. Man, I thought Newcastle started off ever so well. Wasn't convinced about how well Liverpool were playing out from the back, you know. And Newcastle were coming for them, and then obviously they get the breakthrough, with the mistake from Alexander Arnold. Then they get the red card, which. I thought it was a red card, Pete. I know there's a lot of people saying it wasn't, but he's so complacent, Verge, you know, and he should have just got round it and accelerated a bit quicker and dealt with it. Anyway, second half, Liverpool were magnificent. Midfield, going forward, I thought it was a hell of a result. And they ended up, Newcastle ran out of ideas, you know, um, and Alisson, to be fair, made an unbelievable save first half as well from Malmö. Yeah. But as a game, as a spectacle, it was fantastic. But there'll be a few alarm bells ringing in Newcastle just that last 20 minutes when Liverpool were down to 10 men. You know, they didn't do enough to win the game. Yeah, Jurgen Klopp happy with uh, the performance of his 10 men in that game for certain. As a coach, I manage whatever I want to say. I never had a game like this. That's the truth. Not that we never turned games. We did that. But uh, with 10 men in an atmosphere like this against an opponent like this, Oh, no, I, I don't, not only that I can't remember, I'm pretty sure it never happened because these moments are rare and super special and um, but I thought the boys deserved it today. Okay, a couple of other issues I want to get the guys thoughts on. Um, I, I, I have to say that as it seems to be going smoothly from, well, Liam uh, Kieran Tierney is now, you know, to Real Sociedad on loan and it's just been it's almost as if people are, are, are people not asking the question, is there a story there? How can you get someone who is tipped to be the next Arsenal captain suddenly so far out of the picture that he's frozen out completely? Yeah, he's, he's clearly fell out with the manager. I think there's been a fallout there. Peter behind the scenes, whether that's been in training or after a game, something's been said or whatever. Um, because when he first went into Arsenal, he was the best player. Arsenal was, was, was struggling. He was getting linked to Real Madrid and Man City for... 40, 50 million pounds, picked up a few injuries of course, but I find it staggering that that Mikel Arteta doesn't see him as part of his maybe 20, 22 players. He can play left centre-back as well, playing a three, play left-back, left-wing-back. 
It's obviously been a, been a fallout there, but a great signing for Real Sociedad. Yeah, absolutely. He's on loan for a year, but by the way, he, he, this is a this is a club that lost the league. It was literally they were the front runner, you know. And if you look at that left hand side, you, you know Zinchenko's a great player, but that left hand side was suspect. I, I agree with you. I don't know if it, there's been a fallout or if Kieran's frustrated lack of game time, which I totally would get. I would totally get, but he's obviously not fitting into Mikel Arteta's plans, and I I don't see it, Pete. Because he's a brilliant player, you know. I think of him like you know, not only you know defensively, go, but going forward, great. And then it's sort of like under the radar that he's gone to Real Sociedad on the Champions League and it's La Liga. But I agree with Tom. I mean, there was a, there was a spell there where he could have went anywhere. There was talking Man City. There was talking Real Madrid. Maybe the injuries a little bit of curtailed him, but he's still an unbelievable player. And <coughs> I'm telling you now, Arsenal fans are not happy with that. I've seen a few things on social media where they're really unhappy about Tierney being let go. Yeah, the other thing about it is, I mean, I've been in his company on more than a few occasions. Kieran Tierney's not a boy, Ruffy, that I think's got an attitude problem. No, yeah. no he's certainly matured, you know, for the early days when he came in to the Celtic team and, and particularly when he went down to England, you could see he physically matured as well. Uh, again, it's all an individual. We are not privy to what's happening behind the scenes, but uh, it certainly doesn't look as if he was getting on with the manager. I think once I've taken something in his head, I watched, I don't know if he's watched the documentary on Amazon. Um, he done the same with uh, Lacazette and Aubameyang. As soon as he gets something in his head, he's... Right, but he's I out. get that, Tom, right? Because there's a bad attitude from mm. those two players, but certainly not from Kieran. No, I, you know no, I mean? totally agree I, with that. I don't, I don't get it. I don't see it. You know, Kieran maybe hasn't got the, the soft feet that a Sinchenko would have, but he's got power and pace and he's a brilliant defender and you're right, he does sort of close the door on people so maybe they have had a fallout and we don't know about it, we don't know Yeah, I've I think Kieran will be really frustrated he hasn't played more I looked at it and I thought immediately there's a story there but um, whether Kieran will want to tell it right now and wait maybe a year until he eventually gets his you know, um, ticket out of Arsenal maybe consistently playing well for Real Sociedad, I certainly hope so um, a couple of players caught the eye at Ruffy. Bellingham scored for Real Madrid and a late winner uh, to get them a 1-0 win against Celta Vigo. Harry Kane gets a double for Bayern Munich. Both these players have just settled in well. Yeah, and they love Kane already. You know, you can see, you know, when he's playing the runs that he makes, you know. It, it just seems to be... He's, he's, when you see him playing, he seems to be just strolling about and then all of a sudden he just switches on. You know, he switches on as long as he's got players running about him who can read into the runs that he's making. And certainly he could have scored another couple as well, but it was good him getting his first goal at home. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, you've got to answer me the question as well. When uh, Diego Maradona played for Napoli um, and when Gaza moved to uh, Lazio, I would watch Channel 4's Italian football, you know, just non-stop. And you just, you just wanted to see pictures of Maradona. And now, for the first time, and it took me a while, the last time I started watching the MLS was when Ibrahimovic was scoring wonder goals. But now... Messi, Messi has suddenly got you on TikTok on little. Did you see his goal last night. It was just outrageous. The pass was outrageous. <laughs> I mean, who sees who sees six players and thinks I'll play a diagonal <laughs> in behind the, <laughs> the one two yet? Yeah, <laughs> He's done it his whole career, Pete. Right? While other people stop, he keeps going, keeps moving. You know, and like he plays the ball and he just keeps going and back across the goal for a tap. But the pass. The pass is just magnificent. Mm. Yeah. And the technique and the timing. And do you remember the picture of Maradona with the six Belgians around him? Yeah. Yes. Semi final of the World Cup? Yeah. It reminded me of that last night. Like, you know, he's got this whole defensive line, <laughs> bump, bump, goal. He just makes the game look ridiculously easy. Yeah, but that's the joy, Ruffy, of football, especially on this programme, where we love talking about special players. There are a few negative things that we have to offer opinion on, but special players like that, you, I never tire of watching them. I don't think any supporter uh, would tire of watching the, the superstars, you know, okay, you get stars at your own team, stubborn stars you don't get a chance to see live, so you've got to take everything on board, but certainly these particular guys that we're talking about are just the entertainers. Yeah, can I just ask you, just to take your mind back, what was your team talk um, that night um, when you played Barcelona? <laughs> What did you say? What do you say to anybody who says, "Unlucky, you're marking the number ten. Yeah, you've got him. Uh, he's like that, Adam Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> just do what you can. <laughs> it was brilliant because you actually just 
condense the play, I remember Yeah, you did, yeah, and then try to force him wide and, you know, he ended up actually at suited us because he ended up going on the right-hand side and coming in on his left foot and we had Adam actually playing at left-back and he's predominantly right-footed, so it actually suited us for Bessie to go on that side, but, the, I mean, he's he's the best player I've ever seen, Pete, like, you know what I mean, I just, for, for what he's brought to the game and his contribution, and he, he just looks like he's enjoying his football again. He didn't look happy at PSG, but all of a sudden he's found his mojo again. It's just... I love him. Absolutely. Greatest of all time for me as well. Yeah, me. Yeah, he's uh, he's uh, he's special. Um, really special. He'd he be my Donald. No, 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 I'm I'm, no, I'm, Ken English. I'm well, Kenny. I mean, listen. Kenny some, was awesome. At all. Kenny was awesome. But uh, I like Pele and, and Ruffy. Are you still sticking with Pele, or are you moving? Pele. Are you moving to the Saudi Arabian Pele state? Some no, no, player. No, Pele played Pele. bounce games. I think had 400 goals over the county bounce games. Yeah. <laughs> so that 25? Yeah. Bounce games. But to, be, friendlies. To, be, to be fair, um, when you play 630 odd meaningful games, Neil, and the other bounce games that you play is because the Brazilian state won't let you leave the country. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you play in a World Cup final at seventeen. Seventeen. You know, um, he scored two in that one as well. Yeah, I don't want to educate Tom too much on this. But he wasn't uh, bad, was he? He was all right, wasn't he? He would have got into a, a few teams. Um, lots of things to look forward to this week. I, I can tell you because we've got the uh, women's football show uh, with uh, Fiona McIntyre, the head of the SWPL, with uh, Kerry Pollock and uh, Alison McConnell. Really good show, well worth listening to because obviously they will be debating. One of the issues which I think is dominating world football at the moment, uh, Luis Rubiales suspended by FIFA um, as the Spanish FA begin an investigation into what we can only describe as uh, it's turning into Kissgate, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, Rafi, because you know, Spanish football is under the spotlight with the handling of this whole situation. Some people may be you know, lost in the dark ages uh, and a lot of women refusing to play for Spain's national side and they want him replaced and some people in the Spanish FA are digging their heels in and backing him. Yeah, there seems to be a 50-50 over there. I think the the ladies uh, will have the shout in this one. They're the ones that are representing the, the country and they're, they're the ones that are the champions. So I think uh, the girls in that team will win this one. Yeah, OK, um, you can hear what Fiona has to say. Uh, and also, as ever, um, we've got Straight Talk coming up all through uh, this month. Some very special guests on our one-to-ones. And we'll have the journals. Uh, Tam Cowan will be with us uh, for the journals this week. Should be uh, quite an interesting debate on some of the red-hot issues surrounding football, not only here domestically in the UK, but uh, in Europe and globally as well. Well worth tuning in. We said we are going to give you variety. And if I can just steer you towards as well as us covering um, all the uh, European football this week, if I can steer you to um, a special uh, programme that we've got where uh, Neil Lennon and Lee McCulloch get together uh, for a cup of tea and uh, look ahead to Rangers against Celtic. Well worthy of watching, yeah. uh, Ruffy, because the two guys used yeah. to knock lumps out of each other, but suddenly head-to-head ch- yeah. chatting about the game. Yeah, I think it'll be very interesting to see which team they predict. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for that, Ruffy. Thanks for that. <laughs> don't, don't gamble on it, by the way. Uh, anyway, um, great to have Neil with us. Will we have him next week? That's this week's competition. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Lennon, Alan Ruff, Tam McManus and myself, Peter Martin. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching today. Right, let's get it to an end.